All right. Geography 101, Chapter 13, Part 3. And we're back talking about culture and the global production of culture. So the global production of culture review is this idea that we produce global space. And what does that mean? It has two meanings, actually. Let's keep it in my nose. It's tickly today. First of all, two meanings. One, we have to create this idea of geography, the idea that we are going to map the world, that we are going to accurately depict the physical surface of the world, that we are going to depict people and places on a map in relation to each other. The idea of place and space, the things we talked about all semester long, absolute versus relative locations, right? And as part of that, you have this idea that the world could be represented in maps, cartographic form. So this is Ptolemy's map we talked about, right? This idea that you could accurately portray the world. The other aspect of the global production of culture, so once we have geography established as a way to kind of measure this, right, is the production of global space. And this leads into the idea of cartographic modernity, this idea of the Eurocentric process that using scientific-based forms of mapping, right, that are very Eurocentric in form are the basis of our knowledge of the culture in space. So a great example here is this phrase, the new world, right? In the 1400s, Columbus comes to what we call the new world, which is what we call North and South America. But to imply that it's new gives it a value that the people who already lived here did not share. To them, this was where they always lived. This wasn't any newer or older than Europe. But to Europe, the established country, they were new. So another example, you rarely see this anymore, right? This clashes with indigenous knowledge. Think about this idea of the known world. In 1490, before Columbus sails here, this is what was considered the known world in purple. So what does that mean, the known world? Does that mean that we did not know that land was here? Well, maybe we didn't. But the th when I say we, I'm talking about the people in Europe. The people who lived in North America and South America, they knew where they were. They knew that they lived. They had their own indigenous knowledge of land and of culture. So the known world concept is a very European aspect, that as European exploration goes around the world, in fact, in a lot of world history books, you might have talked about the age of exploration, right, in the 15 and 1600s, which is more realistically the rise of European expansionism and colonialism. These areas were always here. But from a Eurocentric point of view, they become known as they were discovered by explorers. Another way we can look at this, how we produce culture, is the tourist gaze, right? So the global industry of tourism, obviously not right now, is huge. You know, people go on vacation, they spend a lot of money. Although I will say I looked uh, last week and if you could find a flight to Italy, it was about 30 bucks round trip, which is down from almost 3,000. Obviously no one's going. But otherwise, it's a big thing. And with space-time convergence, as it gets cheaper to travel farther and fast, people go on more vacations, and they have more places to go. 300 years ago, you didn't have the ability to hop on a train or a plane and go around the world for spring break. You probably went 30 miles if you were lucky. So now we see this. And all these areas are vying for tourist money. And so if I say... We're going to go on a cruise to the Caribbean. This might be what you see, but is that truly an accurate cultural depiction? Maybe you're not going to see the other parts of it, right? So that's the tourist gaze. What do people expect to see? How do places create their tourism views? Um, I've heard the phrase often, the Disneyfication, right? If you go to Disney World, it is this artificially created area that is extremely uh, attractive and clean. But that is constructed for tourists. That's not what all of Florida is. There are areas of Florida that are horrible. And for areas that are great. I should say that too. But the idea of what is acceptable. Uh, various meanings. Now people spend big money to go eco-touring. Go on trips where they hike up and down the Pacific Coast. Or they go out to New Zealand and climb these trails. And they go, in a sense, to areas that 20 years ago no one went to. Eco-tourism. I find this one fascinating. This was actually a thing I found. Kiberia, the friendliest slum in the world. And this is in Nairobi. And you spend 2,500 uh, Kenyan dollars, which is approximately 25 bucks, and you get a guided tour of the slum. Oh, look at the beautiful children. Let's take a selfie. Right? 
Do you honestly think what this tourist has seen is the real example of the slum, or is it a cultural, you know, a build to fit the tourist gaze, right? If you've ever gone to another country, uh, I'll use the example. If you go to Mexico and you go to one of the resort towns like Cancun or Acapulco, that's a much different view of Mexico than if you go to a little village, you know, 30 miles away. So all of this idea, right, the geographical knowledge of the world that we talk about, the Eurocentric views, who produces that? So to write about the earth, we usually read from people who are privileged enough to do this, those in charge. Think about who wrote your textbook, right? Is he some villager in sub-Saharan Africa, or is he an academic who spent years in school in a Western country? So that is a part of imperialism. We have higher education. We have more knowledge because we've, in a sense, appropriated it. That doesn't make other knowledge less valid, but that's who writes textbooks, isn't it? How you write what you write is part of this. So here's an example. Orientalism. This is an idea where you are writing about the non-Western places by those in the West. So our textbook author, or me, talking to you about Asia, or Africa, or China, or Europe, right? So places that aren't the West being described by those from the West. And inherent in that are some different political meanings. Think about that, right? If you're talking about a culture that isn't yours, it's very easy to fall into that trap where you're discussing it in a way that is not favorable. You're describing them as alien or exotic, when in reality, they're just different. The opposite of that is ornamentalism. This is looking at things, social groups east and west around the world as being equal and looking at similarities, not so much differences. And the last aspect, occidentalism. This is basically the opposite of Orientalism. Those in the anti-West, those in Africa, Egypt, uh, Asia, India, China, talking about the West, United States and Europe, from their point of view. And of course, in our country, we cannot get away with culture without talking about money. Commodification. We buy and sell culture left and right. Every single one of you who wears a t-shirt with a logo or a shoe that is made by a specific name brand, or listen to a particular artist or type of music and have paid for it, are all part of this, right? And sometimes culture transcends locally. So hip hop is now worldwide. And so it has been commodified into a global form. Some would argue that our culture has spread the most because within the US alone, we have so many subcultures, so many smaller groups, that in order for someone to be truly accepted by all the United States, they've already kind of smoothed over some cultural differences. I love this term, glocalization, right? So this right here is the veg breakfast sandwich in India, in McDonald's. This is sold in India. It's basically their version of an egg McMuffin, but it's vegetarian. This is a vegetarian patty. In India, vegetarianism is much more highly prevalent. Uh, some people will not eat any meat, and so the McDonald's menu reflects that. It's still McDonald's, but there's changes. So when it comes to this idea of culture and commerce, right? Symbolic cultural meaning is given to economic goods. So Ikea, if someone shops at Ikea, there's some definite cultural assumptions about what they are, who they are. And that is in large part due to what Ikea sells. They sell furniture. It's not, uh, you know, very specific but also where they locate. They build in suburbs. There are large stores. They do not build in inner cities, so that's a whole different market, which is a much different, say, you know, cultural economic symbolism than the furniture store that you maybe have down the street from you. They're both furniture, but different shoppers and different types of styles. And even within that, some products are marketed towards different cultures. So here is the Chevy Tahoe, which is a basic... Um, Chevrolet truck, uh, very large, but it's also the exact same thing for the most part as a Cadillac Escalade. Now, people don't buy the Escalade to go out in the backwoods and fill it with firewood. That's what they buy the Tahoe for. The Escalade is marketed to a much different crowd. Uh, it's much more fancy, has much more chrome, has shinier wheels, and it has a lot more uh, interior gadgets. It's marketed towards the up crowd. If you're driving the Cadillac, 
that's saying something about who you are. It's called conspicuous consumption, right? What kind of car do you think your doctor drives? If you ask you that question, does he drive a Volkswagen or does he drive a BMW? And if you have a specific answer for that or a thought in your mind, that's because we attribute certain goods to certain parts of culture. That's my son in the background. He's having lunch. Hi, Henry. So that leads us. We're going to have a visitor in just a little bit. That's the M. That's right. McDonald's, the myth of homogeny. A lot of people say that with the space-time convergence, as it becomes easier to communicate and travel, we are going to have one global culture. Homogeny, all the same. I mean, you see McDonald's everywhere, right? But I say that's a myth, because you can have a global culture, but like I just showed you in India, there are still local contexts. Vegetarianism in India is a much more prevalent part of the culture than it is here. You don't see a veggie egg or a veggie breakfast sandwich in McDonald's here. You don't see that, but you do see it in India. In Japan, they have much more seafood on the menu. So yes, it is McDonald's in many ways, but there are local adaptations. And again, globalization. Local cultures are adapting. That goes back to one of the first things we said. Culture does not exist in a vacuum. It is constantly being interpreted and redesigned. Okay. Homogenization assumes that everything is consumed the same way, and it's not. Well, there we go. We made another online lecture. Again, look at these uh, points when you come time to study for your midterms. Great little study guides. So thank you much for listening. Uh, and that is all I have for you until next time.